This is episode 126 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Fernando Angelucci. He is the CEO of SSSE. We're going to talk all about self-storage today. He started in residential, got into multi, transitioned all the way into self-storage full-time. Fernando, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jen. Yeah, no, I'm excited to talk to you. And we first met on a mastermind where we dragged you on to tell us all about self-storage. It's probably like two, three years ago now. So I'm excited to see what you've been up to. Um, but when was the first time that you remember being interested just in real estate? Yeah, uh, very easy. I was 16 years old and I picked up a book of uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And from there, I I never liked reading. I was one of those kids that liked to clown around and stuff and devoured the entire book in two days. And from that day on, I knew I was going to become a real estate investor. Yeah, it's it's funny because it, like a lot of us always make fun. Oh, you're going to tell the Rich Dad, Poor Dad story. But like for, for most people, that book really just is the thing that unlocks it because it's so accessible to read and then say like, wait, I, I, could, I, could, I could be that kid. What was the first thing that you did to put it in play at 16 to like say like, I'm going to start taking steps for this to be my future? Yeah, so... You know, I'm a son of two immigrants. So when I started talking about, you know, being a business owner and potentially not going to college, my dad threatened to end my life. Um, so I actually went to college first. And when I was 19, I started my first company, which was a company painting the exteriors of residential building. Hmm. So I'd go to school at University of Illinois. And then on the weekends, I'd go back to Chicago make offers or estimates for people. And during the summer, I'd book them up for the summer and then I hired my friends to start the painting company. So that yeah, was yeah. to date, probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life because it was the first time I ever had to run a business. Yeah. And from there, then I knew I was, I was ready to go. And once I graduated, I lasted, I, I don't even think I lasted 13 months as an engineer and yeah. immediately <laughs> went to starting to flip houses and, and assignments of contract. Yeah, but that's interesting, though, because you were young at the time. And I've talked to so many people who are now full fledged investors. And they said, you know, I had a personal residence and a couple of rentals, but I didn't think I was an investor. And I was like, what? Because I, mean, I try to convince first time home buyers, you're an investor. Like, this is the biggest investment you made. What do you think it was about where you were at or maybe where you wanted to go that made you think like investing? I can see where this is going to make money. These are all investments. Yeah, the thing for me was always time freedom. So, you know, my family in the beginning was kind of a tough go trying to establish themselves in the United States. Yeah. But then once um, they started catching traction and getting good jobs, I realized that they were they were exchanging a lot of time for those jobs. So, you know, there was yeah. times where my dad, every Monday, you'd have to fly to a different city, stay there until Friday and then come back. And I didn't want that lifestyle. I wanted to be able to do what I wanted, when I wanted, with whomever I wanted. And I realized that the only way to achieve that is by controlling my own time freedom by, by having a, a business or, a, or an investment vehicle. Then enters my next phase of my life, which is having tenants. And looking back, I wish <laughs> I would have just skipped completely over this step because it yeah. was a nightmare, especially because I was chasing yield. So I was buying things in the south side of Chicago, yeah, yeah, middle of nowhere, Indiana, because I saw some high ca cap rate on some spreadsheet. But then in reality, right. that's not what actually happens, right? Yeah. So we, we went a couple yeah, of years. You were, you're chasing yeah, a solid cash flow means very difficult tenants. Usually, usually when the right. cash flow is overwhelmingly, like, how is this even possible? It's usually because the tenants are difficult or there's, you know, uh, undone repairs. I'm just telling you right now, uh, unless you're a huge company that knows how to operate in very challenging areas, you're not going to get those returns on paper. I'm just going to tell you, yeah, just assume 50% yeah, yeah, exactly. of the time you're not going to get rent. Yeah. So your, your 18 cap is now like an eight, right? Yeah, or exactly. less. So right. it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I got tired of tenants, toilets, and trash very quickly. Um, you know, evictions that lasted nine months, pouring concrete down the plumbing out of spite. Uh, it was just a nightmare. So I said, you know what? I can't, I can't deal with people anymore like this. So I said, okay, what assets can I go into where I don't deal with people? And the first was data centers. Didn't have, you know, $100 million to mount up my first data center. So that was immediately out. The second yeah. one was mobile home parks. And 
I called some people that I knew had mobile home parks and I was like, oh, you know, they just rent the lot, right? And he's like, dude, that's not actually how it happens. Either you're going to yeah, get yeah. those properties back, you're going to have tenants again. I'm just like, oh, okay. So that's not going to yeah. be an option. Yeah. And then I found out about self-storage and it checked all of the boxes. I said, you know what? No evictions. No one's allowed to live in my asset. Yeah. Everything's made out of concrete and steel. You can't damage it, you know, easily unless you run a, a truck into it. So I think this is the way that I'm going to go. And then immediately started to spin off uh, my entire rental portfolio. I didn't even care what the price was. I, I wasn't even trying to get the highest price. I was just trying to right. get rid of the headache. Yeah. So from 2016 to 2018, we were unwinding the, the rental portfolio, but I had to learn now a new asset class. So what did I do? I went back to my old friend wholesaling. Yeah. But this time I was dealing business owner to business owner and it was much more gratifying because yeah. I, I didn't have this feeling of, oh man, you know, these people need this money to go pay rent, or whatever. These, these guys already, you know, we're talking minimum purchase price, a million dollars. Right, right. Right. And I did this to test the, my knowledge and the market. If I could find a storage facility faster than a broker can find it, I can get it at a better price. And then I could sell it to someone that's got 30 years more experience than me for a higher price than I have for it. I'm probably doing something right. So tell us about self-storage and like, you know, your landmark principles of how you've grown your business around self-storage and why it's so much easier for you. And that's it. it and I think it's really important to know your personality. Like I don't like tenants either. You know, when I had uh, rentals, my sister, you know, dealt with the tenants and I dealt with the legal implications because I, it's just not for me. I don't want to do that type of thing. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's a couple, um, main tenants that I love about self-storage and then I'll tell you how I, I take a different approach to our business than most people do. Yeah. Um, you know, number one, no evictions. It is lean law. Uh, so <laughs> what happens <laughs> is when they put their stuff into your your unit, they are de facto by state law, giving you a lien over their property. And if they do not pay, depending on the state within 45 days to 60 days of their first missed payment, you have already sold all their stuff off. You've recouped all of your losses. Now, if you make a profit, you can't take it. That extra money has to go back to the, them. Or if you can't find them, it has to right. go to a state unclaimed funds thing. So that's not a, a revenue generating yeah, it's Spot. not really storage wars doesn't really work out no. the way it's, it looks like it yet. No. Um, the second thing is when I look, I'm a data's guy, right? I'm an engineer. So when I looked at back 30, 40 years and back tested my, my principles, I realized that self-storage was producing much higher than the other asset classes that I was looking at consistently, uh, yeah. even into, into, into today, right? So it, it was something like a difference of over a 30 year period. If I started with a hundred thousand dollars, if I put in the S and P 500, it'd be like half a million. If I put it into the, into multifamily, it'd be like 1.8 million. And if I put it into storage, it was like 4.1 million because compounding is the yeah. eighth wonder of the world. Right. Absolutely. So that's the, the second reason I love it. And then the third reason I love it, it has this, this sticky factor. Once someone gets into a storage facility. For them to leave, it is such a pain. So you, you can, bump I'm living up. that right now. I've told everybody that like, you could, you could go up on me. Like, I, I hope my self storage facility is not listening. Like they go up probably like 15 bucks every, I don't even know how long I, it's just not worth moving. Right. That's what you're going to say. I know it. It's just so annoying Death for me as, as someone. Thousand cuts. Yeah, exactly. It's a million, a million tiny yeah, paper million cuts. cuts. Yeah. yeah. So because of that, it. It allows us to keep up with inflation a lot faster than, say, a multifamily tenant that signs a one-year contract. My yeah. contracts by state law are 30-day contracts that auto-renew every 30 days, which means I can raise rents at any point as long as I give more than 30 days notice. Yeah. Um, but I, so I, I love this, this, this fast. I mean, look at industrial. People love industrial, but in industrial, you're locked into five to 25-year contracts, depending on what yeah. type of tenant you have. And then if all of a sudden you have something like a COVID where our inflation jumps up 16% in like one night, you know, there's yeah. nothing you can do.